right, guys, are you ready? Yes. We are here to talk about the light. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. There is this very particular light inside of each of us that we are all covering up with one of the greatest and most popular excuses on planet Earth. I couldn't help it. I'm just like that. Other variations on that same theme, I'm a Pitta. I'm my father's daughter. I'm a Libra. Think of yours while your eyes are closed. I want us all to get to a place where we will never ever say again, I could not help it. I want to get us all to a place where every single one of us is standing so clearly on the planet, choosing exactly what we do and exactly what we say and exactly how we say it more of the time. And when that option is presented, just said even, you can feel it in your heart. You can feel a longing for that state. Ultimately, this is about how each of us can be a leader in our families, in our workplaces, in, for those of you who teach yoga, in your classes, but mostly in your family. Because that really is the first place to start. That really is the ground <clears throat> of all being. And that really is where we can stop first this insane conversation within ourselves around blame. That we would have the audacity to blame somebody else for our experience is where I want to begin. So the mission toward revealing this light is releasing the inner conversation. The one that is going on right now, the one that is being referenced all the time, the one that Dr. Chopra referenced last night, to my delight and chagrin at the same time, but mostly delight. The inner dialogue that told me that it was fine to lie, that told me that it was fine to live in pain, that told me that it was fine to live in fear. The, the conversation that tells me that nobody really around me would be able to handle my truth, so you know what, I'm just gonna keep it a secret for a while, and that's, that'll be safe. Secret safe with me. Except that telling the truth actually helps us to release this remarkably agile inner commentary. And the minute you start to tell the truth, the commentary suddenly has no space, no place, no function in your body. And it's what's most interesting and most um, exciting about this is that it's exactly like yoga. It's exactly like any other movement. You actually have to practice telling the truth in the most awkward situations. Practice so that this dialogue starts to lose its charge and its hold on you. So while your eyes are still closed, just for a couple more moments, how many people can relate by a show of hands to this inner dialogue, this conversation that you're having all the time in there? 90%, I would say. And just for fun, now you can open your eyes because this is always very enlightening. How many of you, because of this inner dialogue, have actually justified writing somebody off in your life completely? You'll never talk to them again because, according to this inner dialogue, they were wrong, you were right, they are never getting into your life again. How many people have that going on? Nice, 50%. And again, just for fun, how many people have uh, still an apology to deliver that you have yet to deliver? Raise your hand. It, and it's always like this, most of the room. If you're kind of on the fence, yes. If you go, well, it's a yes. <laughs> how many of you have somebody that you need to forgive that you haven't forgiven yet? That's usually 
Yep. Yep. Else you're lying. <laughs> so last night, Dr. Chopra pointed out in his speakeasy that um, the quality of this inner conversation actually is the main factor in our immunity. In his experience as a medical doctor, he would see patients, two patients, same disease, same symptoms, even same age, same treatment, same drugs, same timing, different outcomes. Why? And he got into it a little bit and then he got really into the science of it, which was delicious to me. It's because of this conversation that you're having inside of yourself. I'm watching people very, very close to me go through this right now where the days that the conversation is positive and uplifting, it's an easy, great day. And the day that it's not, it is a scandalously difficult day for the person and for everybody around that person. Everybody can relate to this, yes? I reached this point in my teaching where I would go and sit up in front of everybody and I would arrange myself all perfect and you know, I'm cute so I can get away with a whole lot of stuff and <laughs> teach good classes for a while. And, and I was in my early 30s and so it was fine. And I finally got to this point maybe a year ago, a little over a year ago, where I was so appalled with the, the chasm within myself, the, the divide between look at all the things that I'm saying and this entire conversation inside of myself that had no relationship to what I was teaching at all. And it was appalling, it was making me sick cellularly, I was feeling it, I was feeling the, the death of what was vital inside of myself. Can we all sort of relate to that a little bit? However, the fun part is that for the longest time I was blaming other people for that experience. And what I realized when, at a very particular point, and I can actually give you some of the lines, it's kind of fun. Um, one of my little interior conversational lines, and I'm sorry if it's a little shocking, but um, you know, I, I couldn't help it. I had to find love elsewhere because it's not here in my house. Yeah. Uh, another one, it's okay to smoke cigarettes and teach people how to breathe. <laughs> Better you should smoke cigarettes and do yoga than smoke cigarettes and do no yoga, right? Except that I was taught later that actually every time I light up a cigarette, every time any one of us lights up a cigarette, you know what we're doing? According to my teacher, Lauren Zander, we are looking to our maker and cursing our maker and the whole creation. <laughs> Heard that, that was the end. That was literally the end. My 25 year on and off love affair was over. When I met my teacher, Lauren Zander, she totally nailed me within 10 minutes. Um, basically, she said that all of the justifications that I had, the ones that I just relayed to you were uh, basically a nice sturdy collection of secrets. And I was either gonna keep them and you know, stay sort of where I was teaching yoga, doing my thing, fine, really, for all purposes, making a living, no problem. Or I could start to actually come clean with all the people in my life, start to tell the truth about what I'm doing and grow in ways, as she said, that I would never even be able to fathom, which was pretty tasty. She had me start doing a lot of writing and I got this very concentrated dose of what is called the Handel method, which I'll talk about a little bit later on in the talk. But what she pointed out is that we all think that we have these secrets. They're ours, we keep them, they're hidden, they're great, they're safe. But really, the secrets totally, actually have us. They own us. Every one of them owns us in some small way, some part of our body, some cellular structure in our body, owned and held by these secrets. And so in a state of contraction all the time that we're not even aware of. And when I was made aware of that, I was done. It was not easy. 
And I can give you a couple of examples of how the secrets led to inner conversations which led to choices that defined my life for a very long time, upwards of 20 years. One good example, just so you guys can start to get an idea, had a crush on a guy since childhood who lived down the block from me. In high school, finally, I was about 14 or 15, got contact lenses, started to get a little cuter. <laughs> and, you know, suddenly he was interested, and so I was deliriously excited. And we got together one night. We were kids. It was totally awkward and hilarious. And, however, after that, he never kind of was there anymore. I immediately obviously assumed, as any normal person would, that, that he was ashamed and I was a loser and it was my fault. And for 25 years until January of this year when I called him up and asked him what his experience was of that moment, 25 years ago, <laughs> because of this work, I was holding in my body the idea that I was shameful. And now this is a very light story. This is a L-I-T-E story. Many of you that I'm looking at, many of the people who are going to be watching this going forward into the future have real serious stories going on, real serious shame secrets in their bodies that are affecting the way their immunity functions in their bodies. And I want that to stop. Like my aim is to get all of that out and clean. I don't want to be having uh, my choices of my profession and my clothing and my friends and my school and my attitudes driven by some assumption around some secret that I don't even know if it's true. I called him up, I said, so, here's it, I'm doing this work, it's a little crazy, I know, but we were 50. Do you remember that night? Yup. How, what was that for you? He was like, well, you were hot, and I was scared, and I don't know. <laughs> this, is the, this is the opportunity that we all have. There are so many stories carrying around in your body that, that are just not true. And it's, it's, it's very profound. You know, if, the one thing that you're thinking of right now, whatever this is sort of conjured up for you, probably a good phone call will sort it out. <laughs> Thankfully, this talk is about the light beneath all of that, the light behind all of that, that the, the first introduction I had to that light was when my best friend from Cornell, her name is Dana, she's, the, she's my resident adventure pusher. She has two boys. She got married like seven years after she was with her man. The boys were already born. She asked me to officiate at her wedding. She's the kind of gal who will take her sons to like a gallery opening at 1030 and they're amazingly behaved. <laughs> they're on an adventure at all times. It's an incredible inspiration to me, her entire existence. And it always was. She asked me to officiate at her wedding. So of course I went online and got my minister's credentials. <laughs> and did so, it was such a delight. She handed me a book in the planning of the ceremony called Unweaving the Rainbow by Richard Dawkins. And it was a huge, very indelible shift in my life. What, what that book comes to is that, Dawkins recounts Isaac Newton's experiment where he took a, uh, a sunbeam and refracted it with a three-faceted prism into a darkened room and, and showed that the white light was actually seven colors, the full spectrum. I learned this in high school. I don't know why I didn't remember it at all, but when I read it in the book at 38 or 9, I was very excited. I thought, oh my god, I'm always looking for themes, obviously, as a yoga teacher, and um, I thought, this is amazing. I still have yet to use it in a class, because I knew it was something bigger than just a, a regular class. When I started to realize what was being said on a human level, each of us has this spectrum inside of it. Each of us is like this light, this white light, insane. And now I can see it. Now that I teach and now that I'm becoming more sensitive, now there's no more cigarettes clouding the view, I can actually see that each of us really is this insane white light. And I can see all of your colors, the ones that you can't see, I see them all. I want to get all of us to a place where you can look at anybody 
anybody in your life, doesn't matter who they are, and you could see every single possibility in them, every color. Then you could look in the mirror and you could see every color of your own. There are, however, these three facets, and if we don't polish them all, if they're not all super sharp, we have absolutely no hope of seeing the full spectrum at all. We have no hope of knowing what greatness really feels like in our own bodies, and if we don't know what it feels like in our own bodies, we can't look at another person and be like, I got you, I see you. What's most important about this is that each of us can actually be aware of these three facets in our bodies and really start to tinker with who's awake and who's asleep. We have, and you can place your hand on your body right now as I talk about it, we have our intellect, our brain, sweet, useful. We have our belly, seat of our emotions, the fluidity in the body. And we have this instinctive whole body. These are the three sort of sub bodies in our body. This is old school. At any given time, and you know what it feels like when all your three bodies are balanced because you're, let's say, 45 minutes into a yoga class. Your body's been working, your brain is off. Your belly is quiet, right? Everybody with me? How about when you're, you're studying with your teachers and you're in that very super receptive state, you wanna learn, you wanna take it in, so your brain has absolutely no agenda whatsoever, you're just absorbing, your belly is super quiet, there's no emotion going on, if anything, it's just with the profound uh, touching aspect of the teaching, your body is completely involved in just absorbing. There's a balance there, right? It's fun to break it down sort of one moment at a time, and I'll give you an example of each when they're out of balance. Emotions, for example, when you are roiling with fear, sadness, even happiness, and you can't seem to get out of that state, feel like you've been sucked in the belly, you go for a run, you go and have a yoga practice, the water's in the belly quiet, everything is kind of evened out. When the body is exhausted, the typical sort of cascade of fatigue is happening. And instead of succumbing to that fatigue or continuing that whole trajectory, you go ahead and you involve your brain and say, okay, go to sleep now. Or when your brain is super active, you cannot get out of your head. You cannot fall asleep. You can barely even close your eyes. I've seen it so many times in Shavasana with people who are like really going through it. Their brain is working so hard. They can't even close their eyes to meditate for five minutes. I get it. And all you have to do is start to feel. Involve your emotions and suddenly your entire body is back in balance. Everybody with me so far on all of this? The fraudulence that I was feeling in my life and in my teaching was because I was completely out of balance in those three parts at any given moment. One was completely wide awake and the rest of it was completely asleep and damaging itself in some hilarious way. And I know that this goes on for a lot of us because every time I talk about it, while I usually don't get the feedback in the moment, I will get dozens of emails. Oh my goodness. You're talking about me. No, I'm talking about humans in general. We are all here in the same boat exactly together. And what I think we have to really start to remember is that if, if we don't calm this deafening conversation inside of ourselves, it will take over. It will make us sick. It will lead us directly to death and not happily. So in order to shift that, I want to start to create the conditions for all of us to know what it means to have the external conversations that will eventually calm the internal ones. Are you with me? Okay. 
This is not easy. This is not scary. If you're feeling appalled by the possibility of talking to that person that you know you have to talk to, you're in a very good place. The yoga practice is amazing in that it shows us how to involve our bodies toward revealing more light in any situation, right? It's, an, it's one of the best tools on planet Earth to move your body in this way and actually get to a place where you're actually having an experience of your own light through your body. Everybody knows this. You wouldn't be here, right? The issue is that I wanted, I wanted an actual instruction manual as to how to stop holding grudges and keeping tabs and tallies on everybody. And the yoga was not delivering that for me. The yoga was not changing the way I was thinking about my mother and who she is, and my father and who he is, my sister and who she, who she is. There was nothing in the yoga for me there. And this is obviously my limited experience. Lots of people beg to differ with me. I'm just reporting my own news. I want to get to the place where love really does fuel everything, everything, everything. And I know that there are a lot of us who want that for ourselves. And so what found me at the very particular point where I knew the yoga was creating the conditions for all this, this conversation and these openings, but uh, it wasn't going the full route. What found me is a company called the Handel Group. This method is basically like a cookbook for your soul. It's exactly how to unpack all of the assumptions and conversations that you've been having your entire life about your sister and your brother and your uncle and your aunt and the one who screamed and the one who freaked out and the one who laughed and the one who did that and the one who did this and start to actually ask people what their experience was and ask for guidance and seek answers rather than presuming that you know the answer and living from there. This is about when everybody's eyes start going. I know, it was me. It's a, it's a privilege to have been on the yoga path for 10 years, 15 years now, teaching for just over 12, 13 years, and to have gotten in one year this very, very concentrated dose of this method, um, which has helped me get my family back. I didn't have them. The conversations that were previously completely unheard of have now become daily consistencies. We talk. I ask people what they need, the people that are closest to me, the people that I was not talking to. I am now very comfortable with every single moment that I see some sort of turn that I am not comfortable with, something's gone askew in any relationship of mine, to just ask. That I never did before. How is that possible that I was teaching yoga and teaching people how to be amazing? And then anybody would do something in my close sphere and I was just like, fuck is that? And then carry that around for the next month until I burst into flames. There are uh, several universities that are now employing this method, Stanford, MIT, soon to come Cornell, uh, a few other, the Ivy League institutions, many, many others, Middlebury. And all the students that are taking this class are learning how to literally design and lead in their lives from a very early age and becoming their own best ally. You know, when you come to a festival like this, you, you start a yoga practice so that you can feel that you want to be your best ally, your best friend. Why should you have to count on somebody else to be your best friend? You want that within yourself. Am I right? For us to go out and have these talks and, and, and write everything down, 
which is what this method requires, and I'll go through briefly what it does require so that you can get an idea, um, is to put in front of ourselves exactly who we are, how we've been, how we've broken down the world into our little categories and filed everything. And so we can see, good Lord, that is not true. There is a whole nother opportunity and a whole nother place for me to put myself, to put my attention, to put my love that I didn't even think of before because I was completely closed off to the light through this conversation that I've been having in my head all this time. Clear? Resonating? Ish? Okay, it's got everybody thinking. I have eyes going everywhere. I will report to you my specific results because it's pretty interesting and fun. My son's dad <clears throat> and I are no longer married and we are the best of friends. My boyfriend and his son's mother, the four of us are now this insanely becoming tighter and tighter every day, tightly knit family unit together. That was not looking possible for a long time. And it was a matter of maybe a series of four 15-minute conversations that brought that about. Is everybody getting it? 15, 20 minutes. What was your experience? I'm so sorry I've been holding this against you for so long. I forgive you. And the world opens. This woman, my boyfriend's ex-girlfriend, who used to take my class 10 years ago, is now becoming a, oh, a very important person in my life. She's one of my best friends. She will always be there. That is amazing. And that is what I wish for everybody. It makes me so happy that my kid gets to see, you know, a, a group of adults who have shifted their contracts with each other and yet opened totally different contracts of so much more healing and value. You know, those kids get to see that. And that's an incredible thing. Let's get practical. If you want to have the audacity to apologize and forgive, you're going to have to do some writing. This audacity is the only thing that's going to help you stop the conversations, and the writing is the only thing that's ever going to help you move the, the dark out. The method takes you through a series of assignments, and they're actually really fun. The first is that you assess 18 very specific areas of your life. You get into personal space, your sex life, your romantic life, your workplace, your community, your family, everything one to 10. One, I am lost in this region. 10, it's amazing. Truly amazing, I would change nothing right now at all. Anything below an eight, and you do have to be honest, you have to write down your dream of what it's going to be in that area, and you have to write down why it's not there. Anything below an eight completely gets overhauled over a series of months with very specific promises and consequences that will reshape your relationship to that area of your life. It is so, so simple. It is so shockingly easy to see what needs to change. And everyone who's looking away from me right now, I know it's not easy. I know. The personal space thing is a big one. <laughs> the sex thing is a big one. 99% of people are not having sex with their lover. How is that possible? You get to write down all the traits that you really do share with your parents. exactly the trait that you're thinking about, of exactly the parent that you're thinking of right now that you definitely do not have. <laughs> that one is you. Exactly you, and it's a beautiful, gorgeous, sweet thing that that's you too. 
I promise. And when you write down the traits, you write down the trait of the parent, you write down how it manifests to the parent, and then you write down how it manifests exactly that trait in you right now, in this moment. I'm frugal, I only tip when someone's looking. <laughs> that sort, I'm in communicative in only this situation. Whatever the traits are. It, it's actually pretty great. What, what that reveals, I know it seems crazy right now, but what that reveals is the overused, insanely overwrought word that starts with a C and ends with an N, compassion. <laughs> I am exactly like my mom. I am exactly like my dad. And of course, the moment that I realize that I'm exactly like them, particularly my mom, Eve DeReef calls me and says, I need to cut your hair. And cuts my hair exactly like my mom's hair in 1975. <laughs> Where a year ago I would have been, oh my god, I cannot even deal. I'm straightening everything, nothing to look like. And now it is a point of such pride that I am my family. And what I get to do is actually evolve all of the things that are not working in me for them, in honor of them, on behalf of them, on behalf of their parents and theirs and theirs. This is our opportunity. And this is exactly the method that helps us do it. There is not another one out there. I have done the research. It's magic. And it perfectly dovetails with the yoga, with all the philosophy, with every single thing that you have studied before in your life. It dovetails seamlessly because all you're doing is writing down what you've thought for so long and choosing what of that is still something that you would choose. Straight Tantra. There is an art and science to it. There's an art to the science and there's a science to the art. You can start to set boundaries once you've done all the, all the homework, you start to set boundaries for yourself. I now have a bedtime that has my skin looking better. Yep. <laughs> a bedtime. I needed a bedtime. Um, you can start to create a great deal of consistency around your yoga, your meditation. You have promises. Somebody else, a friend of yours, a, a colleague of yours, somebody that's doing the work with you, they get to hold your promises. You don't keep your promise, there's a consequence. And the consequences are such fun to design. <laughs> and lest you fall into the realm of, oh, that's just another rewards and punishment thing. No, 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 no. There's no punishing here. There's you fighting for remarkable. <laughs> do this, this is going to happen, that's funny, I'm not gonna do it again. It has to be funny and effective. I'll give you an example. I've used this before many times. My son and I have now this amazing relationship and understanding. I inherited some rage. And so one of my little conversations was that, oh, it's fine. You know, he won't, he's not going to pick up on my rage at all. He'll be fine. And sure enough, three and a half, I'm seeing a maniac in my house, slamming doors, just like somebody else I know. So I created a consequence. First it was $5, that didn't work so well. Every time I get mad, $5 to the sidewalk, out the window on the 21st floor, didn't work so well. Five bucks is not a lot of money. $50, however, when I tell Jonah that my consequence is $50 and the next time I get mad it's 50 bucks and he's taking the money and he gets to throw it out the window on the 21st floor and then we have a hug and mama gets to say she's sorry and he gets to say he's sorry for not listening. That has cost me $600 <laughs> to date. But guys, think about how many thousands I'm saving into the future on his therapy. <laughs> now we have conversation. Oh my God, he's like, Mama, 
$50. <laughs> Mama, that's it again. Mama, breathe. <laughs> and immediately, we have the most insane connection I think that I have with another human. And I have some good ones. Here we are in this community. There's a lot of love. I have the strongest connection with my child, the one that I dreamed that I would have, but I could not even see the possibility for having because I was so mad all the time and trying to get to the next thing. Jonah. Ugly. That's one of many, many, many consequences, um, but a good one because it resonates. The gift is that you will never say again that you have no idea how that happened. I don't know. Here I am again, drinking again, smoking again. Well, it's OK. Whatever it is, I have no idea how that happened. It will never come out of your mouth again. Would anybody like that? Close your eyes again. We're going to get this to a place where the inner dialogue actually gets to a little whisper, and it gets funnier, and it gets sillier. And then, as I have noticed in my own experience, the people around you suddenly are funnier and sillier. And all the people that you've attracted to your life, you've magnetized this person with such a shitty attitude, you've magnetized that person with that kind of situation. Suddenly everything starts to shift into a place of very humorous silly. Shifts into silly and sweet. Start to breathe in a way that evens out the resonance and the spaciousness in your belly and in your brain. Think about the whole area around your brain, between your skull and the matter of your brain, softening and opening. Think about the area around your actual stomach, softening and opening, and having those two places be equally spacious, totally a reflection of one another, easeful, sweet. You feel how your heart starts to gently open when those two places are even. That resonance is the option that we have. It changes us cellularly when we do this. And it allows us to engage with ourselves and the people closest to us in a completely different way than the one that we think is possible now. If you wish, you may open your eyes again. What I want to do is make sure that each of us starts to look at the people near us with a lot more abundance and a lot more healing in our eyes. That's really the final, the final aim that we look at the people nearest us with much more abundance and much more healing from our vantage point, right? And for me, in mixing these two practices, the yoga and the Handel method, the choice became mine. The world became mine. I have a mother and a father that I love and I respect in a way that I never suspected I would ever be able to do. I have a relationship with my sister who I love now and I respect. She is an amazing human being. Two years ago, I was going to tell you that she was the mad one and she wasn't nice to me. And it was me with a whole set of assumptions and an entire conversation around who she was that had nothing to do with reality. I think a lot of the times in yoga we talk about oneness, and this is sort of the final couple of thoughts. We have to really, if we really want that oneness, we have to really merge in a way that is not the merging that we're talking about in some esoteric level on an ashram. It's a merging with exactly who your family is and how they have been. Merging in a way that actually helps everybody recognize themselves and heal 
along with you. Evolve along with you. The whole conversation that's happening in your head begins to evolve on behalf of, in honor of your lineage. You bring light to your lineage when you do this work. And when you combine it with the movements, the yoga, the meditation, to be able to see yourself that clearly, it is a revolution. Now in my family, we laugh and we respect each other and we hold each other, we touch each other. It is a completely different game now. And this is possible for all of us. This light that I have found in my family, it exists in the caves of every single family in this room. It exists in the families of every single person who ever listens to this and beyond. It exists everywhere, that light. If we can stop covering it up with this conversation, we have the hope of actually revealing it and magnifying it and amplifying it like crazy all around us. So my dare is that you get aware of these three facets of yourself. All of a sudden, I'm trying to sit and meditate, but I'm doing the dishes. My body is not my own. I'm trying to sit and meditate, but my brain is thinking about email. My brain is not my own. I'm trying to do something productive, and my belly is crying out. My emotions are not my own. I want to get, I dare you to get aware of who is in charge at any single moment of your day in these three facets of your life so that you can actually see who is leading, who is driving your car. Is it your brain? Is it your emotions? Or is it your body with nobody else at the helm at all? Because at any given point, you can pretty much bet one or two, maybe, are in charge. And the third one, nothing. A few weeks ago, I went to see the, the uh, 13 indigenous grandmothers. Amazing. At Urban Zen. And one of them said that we were given instructions, instructions that we've actually forgotten. And she said, open mind, open heart, open spirit. She said, greet each other in a good way. Now, had she said that to me a year ago, I would not have understood the profundity of that statement. But now that I have the blessing of being able to say that no choice of mine is not made by me, I make them. I determine how my day goes. I know exactly how to greet myself so that now I have the hopes of greeting my students, my family, all of you in a very good way. Thank you all so much. Namaste. Thank you so much. I think we have time for Three questions. Anybody who needs to go, please feel free. I won't, I won't be mad. Please. I wanted to ask you, you were talking about how I do the self-dialogue mm-hmm. to start with your family. Mm-hmm. My inner dialogue is generally self-deprecating. Yeah, most of us are. But it's not, it's, it's constant. Yeah. And uh, I used to be very adventurous and love trying new things and experience, but now I'm scared of a lot of things because I'm always telling myself I'm limited because of my weight. And I'm very self deprecating about that. And how would I start with my family and able to stop that kind of inner life? The first thing 
we would do is actually just start creating a set of parameters around your um, self-care. Hold off on your family right now. You have the idea, and usually just to hear the idea and hear the seed get planted in your body and feel the, the tears that come from that, whether they're actually falling from your eyes or you're just feeling them inside like static, that's just a sign that you should let it gestate for a while. The first thing you do is get to a place where you trust yourself so implicitly that there's nothing you're afraid to do or say. So we would create, and I'm glad to work with you, we would create a whole set of boundaries, exactly like my bedtime, around what it is that you can do that helps you feel amazing and nourished and there for yourself. And then we start to move into the conversations that you can and may have and how to have them. Because there you're coming from a place of you know how to greet yourself, then you know how to greet other people. Well, that's definitely the point because I take that out on every. Oh, yeah. You'll take it out with people closest fault. to you. Oh, it's their fault. It's always their fault. <laughs> because I couldn't their... help myself right. because I'm a Scorpio. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how Scorpio's a good one, though. <laughs> I'll give you something there. But you, you get the point. You get the point. Okay. Thank you. Please. How do you forgive and still love boundaries? I think I set myself up as an where I'll say, okay, I forgive you. And then the next time that situation came up, I knew that was I knew it. I knew I couldn't trust them anymore. And it gets to this whole, should I forgive them or should I not trust them anymore? How do you uh, truly forget, like you're saying, you had a conversation? Your family sounds exactly like my family. Oh, it's everybody's family. My sister, everything. How do you say, I, why did you do that? This is why. Okay, I forgive you. Let's move on. And then I honestly move on. Okay. The forgiveness that you are talking about, when we talk about forgiveness, it really has to do with how, again, how we address ourselves first. You've still not forgiven yourself. <laughs> it's very hard to do that. You forgive yourself, your entire being softens. And then the boundaries that you think you have to set between you and this other person are naturally, organically there. There's a softening that has to happen within ourselves, a forgiveness that has to happen within ourselves. Oh my God, I wasn't there when my grandmother died and she was asking for me. I still haven't forgiven myself for that. How is that impacting the choices that I make right now? I realized that that was the reason why I was resenting my mom. It's crazy, we're crazy. Work on writing down what you have to forgive in yourself will actually lead you exactly to what you can really, 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 really forgive in that other person and then they're not going to let you down anymore because you're not going to let you down anymore. The tone of the conversation that we have within ourselves is exactly, precisely the tone that you will hear in all of the people around you. You hear shit in a tone and somebody around you, something's going on inside of you, I can bet on it, all of my money. I knew that would happen. Brat, brat, brat. Yeah, because you set it up in some way. It's scandalous. It's so, it's crazy. It's, it's so perfect. It fits. It's, it makes perfect sense when you start to wrap your mind around the simplicity of it. It's like, oh my God, yes, I set everything up to be exactly like this. Now what do I do? Now how do I set myself up to trust myself, forgive myself, move with myself in a way that I am always there for myself 100% more than anybody else would ever dream of being for me, I'm there for myself. Then everybody starts to follow suit. That's how it works. Already I just watched your whole thing soften there. Very cool. I think we have time for one more question if anyone has one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, I. Oh, how do you meet the hamburger, or what? How are you introduced to the ham that? Uh, 
uh, it's a very sweet story, actually, a very quick one. Um, I was ending my tenure with Adidas. I was the global yoga ambassador for them for a year. I knew that I didn't want to do it for more than a year. It was lovely, but it was too much traveling for my family. Um, so I went and had a meeting with a dear friend of mine who said he was sort of representing, working with two people. He said, um, this life coach, and this is, by the way, not somebody that you would expect to say the words life and coach in the same sentence, and this genius lighting designer. Within a week, I was sitting with the life coach, you know, reluctantly, kind of on my phone, telling her how sad my life was, that I'd been cheated on and left, and la la la. She's like, oh, people who get cheated on are usually cheaters. Find that yourself, and then we can work together. I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs> It was there. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My son's dad and I have gotten to a place where we forgave each other for everything, categorically everything, everything, everything. We have a stronger relationship than most people I know because of it, because of this woman, because of this method. Two weeks later, she says, come a little bit early or late or something to your session. I have somebody I want you to meet. She introduces me to this guy, Bentley Meeker, who's like the biggest event lighting designer in New York, who's now the love of my life the light guy. <laughs> yeah. So that's how that happened. And, uh, and she, she literally, she saw what I was capable of. She saw what, what the quality of people, the caliber of people that I have around me. And she said, I want you to know everything that I know. You're going to have to do a little writing and literally spent the next three months writing my bio, every single one of these 18 areas and how ugh, they were. The parent traits. And then there's a thing called hauntings, which we haven't even gotten into. And that would be the example of me calling up the high school boy and saying, hey, I know we're 40 now, but uh, <laughs> can I just check in with you about something that happened 25 years ago? And it's such a healing. We have a laugh. Oh my God, how are you? Are your kids? You know, it's always how it goes. And always, by the way, tangentially but not, every time you think that something is going to go terribly bad, when you're really the most afraid to have the conversation and ask about this person's experience, every single time it goes so sweetly. They're always like, I don't even know what you're talking about, woman. What is that? I don't even remember. It's so fun, every time. The more scared I was to call a person or email a person, the funnier it was. I'm free. This is how we get free. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. I have no story. There's nothing I won't tell you. Ask me anything, I got it all. I'll tell you everything. I'm free. I'm so grateful.